Hi there, and welcome to this very exciting tutorial on how to be a pro at using Keyshot. Uh, in this tutorial, we'll cover a few workflow tips and tricks and some things that you might not be aware of that you can do within Keyshot, as well as how to improve the overall quality of the finished results. So without further ado, we are in a Libre Design, and we have a beautiful model of a drill press by uh, William Forsyth. And uh, the first thing that we're going to do is make sure that the bottom of our model, in this case, you know, this surface here, pretty obvious, is aligned with one of the three principal planes. And most of the time, just by the nature of how you model stuff in a Libre Design, this will already be done for you. But just be sure that it is, because uh, it's so much easier if you need to rotate this inside of Keyshot. That allows you to be able to do it by easy increments like 90 or 180. Uh, if it's off in the middle of nowhere at an odd angle, you'll never get it right, and it'll just be a, uh, an exercise in patience. So uh, the second thing that you want to do is make sure that you're always giving Keyshot enough geometry to work with. So the way that you do that is you go to the gem, and you go to Properties. Select Display. And make sure that your facet resolution is on Fine. Now, for huge models, you, you, maybe you don't want to work with the facet resolution on fine inside of Libre Design day to day. That's totally fine. Just make sure that before you send it to Keyshot, you send it back, you set it to fine, and then you can set it back uh, to a lower value. We're already at fine, and so we're going to go ahead and go into Keyshot. To do that, we'll click Keyshot and Render, and I already have it open. So this is the way that it looks when it first comes in. Uh, now you'll notice that. I don't have my window set to take up uh, the entire screen. You know, I'm on a 4K monitor. I don't need uh, all that taxing on my PC during this initial phase when I'm just applying some textures. So I set it to lower. I set it to 1500 by 1500, or maybe you want to do 1000 by 1000. Whatever makes sense that, that gives you kind of a really responsive uh, interaction with Keyshot. The second thing I'll do is I'm going to turn on performance mode. I don't need all the fancy shadows and the reflections and things like that right now because my primary objective is to do a bunch of clicking and assign a bunch of materials. Uh, and I don't, you know, m my primary objective here in consideration is being able to see stuff. And so taking out all the shadows makes that easier. So the workflow that I'm going to use here is perhaps a little bit unintuitive. And, uh, and you'll see why we do it in a second. And this is especially a good workflow for really big models, or maybe you have hundreds of fasteners, and um, you know any kind of model like that, it's going to be a lot of clicking, and you want to make sure that you're clicking in the most efficient way possible. So the way that I found after rendering you know thousands of models in Keyshot is the following workflow. I'm not going to worry about the correct materials. I don't care about any of that. What I want to do is get something that's high visibility, that's easy for me to see, and and link a bunch of parts that are the same material to that. So let me give you an example. Uh, the top of this plastic housing is made up of a lot of different parts. Um, and my objective right now is to link them together. That's the only objective. So I'm going to just drag any material onto there. And I suggest like shiny paints because they render quickly. Um, I'm going to left shift left click on this one as the source. And I'm going to start shift right clicking on every other part in this model that I can see that shares this material. Uh, and I think that's about it. So now my, my next piece of the workflow is to hide all of these parts so that they get out of the way. So I'm gonna go to the Scene tab and I'm gonna right click on any of these parts that I've just applied materials to. Now I'm gonna select parts with material. And then I'm gonna go over here and I'll see you know one of them is selected along with the rest. Click on any one of those and visibility hide, All right? That just gets them out of the way. And especially if you have a bazillion fasteners or lots of stuff, you'll very quickly see the value in this, uh, in this workflow. Okay, number two is I'm gonna pick any different color, doesn't matter what it is, and I'm gonna apply the same material uh, wherever else that would be in the model in much the same way. I think that's probably all of those. I'm going to right click, select parts with material, go over to one of them, visibility, and hide. Right. Now let's work on the fasteners. And you'll notice I don't, I don't, again, I don't care 
what material. None of these are actually painted. Maybe some are. Uh, but I'm picking really high visibility stuff. And what that lets me do is, uh, you know, I can kind of easily notice if something's not red, right? Um, and so that's the, the primary reason I want to do that or fuchsia or anything else. Okay, um, now we're ready to kind of, you know, see the fruits of our labor. So I'm going to right click, I'm going to show all parts. And this looks a lot more grouped than it used to. Uh, we have all our fasteners in red, we have the anodized material in purple, we have the shiny metal in uh, orange, and I can, uh, you know, quickly see if I've missed something, you know, that it's just gray or something, I can, uh, I can go through and, you know, assign it the right material. And, you know, perhaps those are all the same color. Okay. So now what we're going to do, now that we've grouped everything, is actually start the fun part, which is applying the correct materials to things. So the way that you're going to do this is pick which one you want, and you're going to drag it and drop it onto any of the components. It doesn't matter which one. They're all linked together. Um, and so, for example, uh, this is probably, this purple stuff is probably an anodized uh, so let me go find a metal, anodized, maybe a, maybe a dark blue. Looks pretty good. Uh, this is going to be, you know, some kind of a brushed aluminum. And this orange stuff is going to be probably just a regular, you know, rough aluminum. All right. So we can start to see this has taken some pretty good shape. I missed a few of them up here. So I'm going to apply the same material to there. And um, maybe I'll just change this yellow to a, a type of a paint. So it's a little bit more shiny. And we're starting to get where we want to be. Um, now, one thing we haven't done yet is change the fasteners. So I'm going to just make those a little bit darker, maybe an iron or something. And, you know, choose whatever materials, obviously, are appropriate um, for your model. But you can see in this way, you know, it's really easy. Once you group stuff, it's really easy to play around, right? I can... Uh, I can say, well, maybe the color needs to be, you know, different or darker or more red or yellow or whatever. Um, you know, it's easy to do when they're grouped, so you don't have to do it to every single instance of a different material. All right, so that's the reason we do that, and just to make uh, less clicking and, and kind of going back and forth to things we forgot or didn't see. All right, now that we've gotten our model mostly textured, um, we're going to go ahead and turn on basic lighting. And this is where it starts to start looking good. The next decision that we have to make is probably the most impactful uh, on the final quality of your model. And that is, what is the background uh, lighting gonna do? So if you go to the environment tab, you'll see that we have all these different options, right? Uh, you can drag them all on and see the effects. Some of these have you know, studio lighting, have these kind of sharp shadows and high contrast. Um, anyway, you have lots of different options here on, on things that you might wanna do. And they all, have, they all change the lighting of the model dramatically. So the primary takeaway that you need to know here is that you are not restricted to just using the default ones inside of Keyshot. There's a lot of good ones, but there's also a lot of uh, really good ones that are not here by default. So I suggest that you go to hdrihaven.com. The good thing about this is that it's, everything is on a CCO license. It's all 100% free. You can use it in your production work. Very few restrictions. Um, so it's a great place to, there's no reason not to take advantage of it. So go to HDRIs at the top. And uh, one that I'm really partial to is on the indoor. 
It's this um, Auto Shop Zero One. And the reason that this one is really good, if you look at some of the other ones, you'll notice that they're, they're, they're cast in a color, right? Uh, this is very yellow. This is very blue, uh, very blue. This one is a really nice even tone. And so the reflections that it gives are just, you know, it's consistently a really great uh, HDR ready use. So let's grab this one. We'll click on it and we're going to make a decision down here. Now, this is where you need to do a little bit of thinking, right? You'll notice that when I drag an HDRI on, it actually replaces the background, right? And you'll notice these backgrounds are pretty blurry. And that's because the HDRIs that come in Keyshot, many of them are low resolution. So if you find a great HDRI and you say, okay, I'm done, um, let's render this puppy out, it's not going to look good because all of this is blurry and just not crisp and precise, right? So you have a few options here. Uh, one option would be to change the background type to maybe a color uh, or maybe a, an image um, that you have. Um, but so if you want to use the HDRI as the background and, and to be able to see it in the final render, make sure you get like an 8K or a 4K uh, at a minimum. If you plan on changing uh, the background to just use a color, and at this point, the primary purpose of the HDRI is just to light the scene, then more often than not, maybe you can get away with, you know, a 4K or a 2K. Um, you know, 4K is probably a good middle ground for most use cases. The higher you go, the longer it can take to render. So just be aware of that trade-off there. Um, anyway, when you find one that you want, we'll use a 4K. It's going to download, and I have, a, I have a copy of this on my desktop. So find out wherever you downloaded it to, and go to the Environment tab, and just drag it in, just like that. And you'll see now it's available to be used, right? So this is now being lit based off the thing I just downloaded. Now, the one that I like, again, is this Auto Shop one. So when I talked about earlier, I'm going to drag that one on. And you can see it just gives a really, you know, a really nice, consistent, well, well lit result with some good reflections. Um, so we're, we're pretty much on our way uh, to where we want to be. The next thing is we're going to notice that, you know, some of this is a little dark. So I'm going to just increase the lighting value right on the canvas. Just press up on your keyboard. And, you know, this is starting to look better to our eye. Uh, you know, your mileage may vary based on your model and your materials. Now we have another problem to solve. And this is a common problem that you'll see. Some of the, the parts of the model are just totally washed out. They're just white. And this is something that you want to avoid because this rarely happens in real life. So some of that, you can kind of just move it a little bit, maybe get it out of the, that direct reflection. Um, and some of it, you need to modify the material. So in this case, no amount of wiggling it around is going to really make this better. So I'm going to double click the material and actually change it, you know, change the color of it to, uh, to where it looks, you know, a little bit more like what I want. And I might do the same for uh, these metal. Uh, maybe I'll make them a little bit like that. And then the last thing that I think people don't do often enough um, is kind of tweak the way your metals look. So uh, the, the biggest factor you're going to find here is the, sh the, the roughness setting. The default roughness, I think, on most key shot materials is 0.1. Now, you can get some really nice effects, especially if you use a good HDRI by setting this a little bit lower. Now, obviously, depending on you know, what the actual shininess value that you're going for is, you may or may not need to change this. But I find that uh, values between 0.01 and maybe 0.1 are, uh, are where you want to you know, mess with. So I, I actually start at point, uh, 0.18 a lot, or 0 0.018, rather. And that kind of gives, uh, you know, maybe that's a little bit too shiny for this particular model, but maybe 0.0, 0.25. It's a little bit better. Um, so this is starting to look pretty good. Um, we've kind of uh, set up everything. We've gotten a really crisp, good HDRI that we can reuse on this model and every other model that we have. Uh, and we've grouped our materials, and they're really easy to change now. Um, and so kind of some of the final steps is just deciding, you know, what you want your, 
you know, your lighting to be product is, you know, pretty good. Uh, it's a good compromise um, for, for most scenarios. And so select the product and then for your background, select your background. Uh, either you're going to use the lighting environment or the color. And a thing to note with color, if you plan on rendering this out as a transparent image and then putting it onto another background, maybe your website is dark gray and here you are rendering this on a white background and you think to yourself, oh, well, it's a transparent picture. It doesn't matter. It does matter and it matters a lot. The reason it matters is because when you render it out transparent, Keyshot's going to anti-alias the edge. And that's a fancy way of saying it's going to smooth it out with a little bit of kind of a blur almost. What Keyshot's going to do is blur it with white because that's the background here. So even if we render this out transparent, the edges of the model are still going to inherit some of that color. So if I go put this transparent image onto a dark background, it's going to have this white edge and you're going to hate it. So just kind of have that in mind, right? If I, if I think to myself, okay, this is going to be on a, uh, you know, a blue background, you know, make your background somewhat blue-ish. It doesn't have to be perfect, but now the, now the, the anti-aliased edge is going to be in the blue family and it's not going to be so obvious. This also affects the shadows in a pretty significant way. So if you ever, you know, put something that you had a white background on with a bunch of shadows onto a dark background later on in your workflow, you'll notice all the shadows look white and it makes no sense. And this is why. So just try to, you know, think a little bit ahead and match what you might be using um, later on in your workflow. That's about it. Um, hopefully you guys learned some good stuff, make some great renders and uh, share them with uh, us on the forum. Have a great day.